All right. So let's talk about simple harmonic motion, sometimes abbreviated as SHO, or simple harmonic oscillators. I say it's actually SHO. Um, but simple harmonic motion. So if we look at simple harmonic oscillation, two textbook examples we typically start you off on, springs and pendulums. So I'm going to give it in this context. So if we look at springs, since you guys have spring, seen springs before in the past, we're going to kind of look at these and do a little bit of review on springs uh, along the way here. So why do they call this oscillatory motion? What do they mean by oscillating? Yeah, it goes back and forth, goes back and forth. And for a per perfect oscillator, it would just go back and forth forever and never stop. Is that what you'd want for your shocks in your car? No, you'd hit a bump and you'd just keep bumping all the way along down the road forever. Definitely not what you want. So for your car, your shocks, you actually want what's called damped oscillations, where it gets smaller and smaller and smaller over time and your car gets back to being nice and steady. And so and ideally, you want it to be heavily damped. That way, you know, it bounces once or a couple times and then you're back to smooth sailing, right? After you hit that speed bump or speed hump or whatever. So, but simple harmonic motion would continue forever. So with a constant period and frequency and all that lovely stuff, it never stop. And that's what we're going to treat formally here. So if we look at a spring. So if I were to take this spring, so in here, I'm going to say this spring is, let's say, on some sort of frictionless surface. So it's not going to incur any resistance sliding along this horizontal surface back and forth. And so here, this spring is fully compressed. And if I had this thing fully compressed, if I let it go, where's it going to do? Fully compressed? Yeah, then it's going to shoot back off the other way. So, and it's going to go through this position. So, and then it's going to get fully extended. And once it's fully extended, what's it going to do? Change direction and go back. So these are three different points in time. And this middle point is the point where if I held this mass and if I let it go, it would not go anywhere. What do we call that point? That's your equilibrium point. We also deal with this kind of thing for a pendulum. So your pendulum swinging back and forth also follows simple harmonic motion. So in this case, we usually only deal with pendulums that have the angle of displacement from the vertical being very small. So that's where our equations really run true that we'll, we're going to drive for the pendulum. So but we usually don't even like explain that in a problem. We just assume that's the only thing you know how to treat, so that's the only thing we're ever going to ask you about. So in this case as well, if I had this pendulum here, and I was holding it up there, and I let it go, what's it going to do? It's going to swing. Why? Because of its weight. Gravity is going to cause it to swing back and forth. And so in this case, in which of these three points in time if I held the pendulum there, the, the end of the pendulum is called the bob. If I held the bob in place and let go where it would not move anywhere. Yeah, the middle one. So this would also be called the equilibrium position of the pendulum. Cool. And so these things just oscillate back and forth, whether it be the spring or whether it be the pendulum. They would just oscillate back and forth forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So, and we could derive an equation to describe so the displacement of these things over time. So in this case, what are our big trigonometric functions to describe oscillatory motion, these repeating functions? Sine and cosine. And technically, we could use sine or cosine. So preferably, you're going to see cosine used probably preferentially. But technically, it doesn't really matter which one you use, sine or cosine. And so in this case, So for the case of our lovely spring here, so we typically use something of this sort, where the displacement x of the spring, of the mass at the end of the spring anyways, is equal to this lovely function. Now again, we could have made this a sine omega t and worked the same way. It's a repeating function as well. They're just off phase a little bit. But it, you can make either equation really work. Now if we just look at the cosine function here for a minute, what are the minimums and maximums of the cosine function? What does it oscillate between values of as a function? One and negative one. Oscillates between negative one as a minimum, positive one as a maximum. So by looking at that then, and it takes everywhere in between, right? What is the minimum value this entire function could have? 
Well, negative 1 times a, which is negative a. What's the maximum the whole function could have? a. And so we see that displacement x has a minimum of negative a and a maximum of positive a, and that's why we call it a, because a stands for the amplitude, which we define as the maximum displacement. And so the displacement away from equilibrium position would be a in this case. So whether you want to call it negative a or positive a, you know, is all about direction of whether it's being compressed or elongated as a spring. But the amplitude, the maximum displacement, is a in one direction or another. Cool. That's why they call it amplitude. Um, if you look, what is velocity? So, uh, well, I mean, what is the definition of velocity in this case? Original velocity you learned back in the day. So displacement over time, displacement over time. And so in this case, we'd normally look at it as delta x over delta t. So what you guys didn't learn being in 111 here, that you would have learned in 121, is that velocity is actually equal to the derivative of displacement with respect to time. Now, I use that nasty word derivative. What, am I, what mathematical field am I pulling from here? Calculus. And so what you find, it's just, you know, if you had a displacement versus time graph, the slope is the same thing as the first derivative. And the slope, you know, rise over run would be change in displacement over change in time. And so that's velocity. So the first derivative is velocity. Well, it turns out that if you take the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, that gets you the acceleration. Notice a derivative just tells you how something changes with respect to something else. How does the displacement change over time? That's velocity, also the derivative. How does velocity change over time? That's called acceleration the derivative velocity over time. And so if you know your calculus, you can come up with these other equations just by taking derivatives of these. So, but do you need calc for a prereq for this class? No. So they're just expecting most of you to memorize these equations. If you've up on your calc, it's less to memorize. So, but I would guess probably like, you know, 5% of students in your class are probably up on their calc. So, but if you look, I put all these on your sheet, your velocity equation, is equal to negative a omega sine omega t. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine, if you're taking it with respect to t anyways. And because t is multiplied by omega, that factor multiplies out on your derivative. If you take the derivative of that yet again, you get your acceleration. And so the derivative of sine is cosine. And so you're going to end up with cosine omega t. But when you take the derivative, again, because omega t is because t is multiplied by omega, that factor comes out, and so you have another factor of omega, so you end up with omega squared. So derivative, of sine is derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine. But that's why the acceleration still has a negative here. But if you notice, the signs here just refer to direction, as we'll see. Well, let's look at this again. If you look, sine functions or cosine functions, what do they oscillate between maximum and minimum values of? 1 and negative 1. So if I hit the maximum of 1, what would the velocity be at that point? Zero. Don't go there. What's anything times 1? one. Nope. Anything times 1 is not 1. It's itself. So in this case, if sine of omega t was at such a time that it equaled 1, what would the whole v equal? negative a omega. And that's the highest that v could ever be. Well, so we'll call that v max. And so v max, we see here, is a omega. The negative just means direction. Whether it points this way, this way, the, you know, the magnitude of it would be a omega. What would be the highest value that your acceleration could ever achieve? a omega squared. Cool. And so these are your three fundamental equations describing displacement, velocity, and acceleration, so of some sort of oscillator. And if you recall the boundaries on your, or the range of, of values really, on your sine and cosine functions, you can very quickly see that, oh yeah, V max is A omega, and A max is A omega squared. Okay, so let's go back a second here. Where's your force of the spring largest? Here, this is the point of maximum compression. This is the point of maximum elongation. This is your equilibrium point. 
what is the force on a spring? Remember Hooke's law? Yeah. F equals negative kx. Why is it negative? Yeah, if the displacement is in one direction, the force is in the opposite direction. So like here, in this case, the displacement away from equilibrium is to the left, but the spring is trying to push back to the right. So, and that's what the negative is. It just shows that the displacement and the force are in opposite directions. Where this gets confusing is notice, a lot of students get confused. Like, how would I get this, you know, spring to compress to this point? Well, I might push it. And notice, I'd be pushing it to the left. Which way would the displacement be? To, to, well, which way though? If I'm pushing it to the left, I'm pushing my force point to the left, and which way does the displacement point? Left. left. And students are like, wait a minute, Chad. So then what does that negative sign do? Well, this force here is not my force that I'm pushing with. It's the force the spring's pushing back with. This is the force of the spring, not the force of me pushing on the object or something like that. So, but your displacement, your force are always in opposite directions for the spring. And so in this case, whether you're at maximum compression or maximum extension, that's where you have the maximum displacement. And if you have the maximum displacement, you also have the maximum force. But if you have the maximum force, then according to Newton's second law, what else will be at a maximum? maximum. Don't go there. What's Newton's second law? Mm, no. Newton's second law? It's a, it's a little equation. F equals ma. F equals ma. And so if F is at a maximum, then what else has to be at a maximum? Acceleration. And so we see here that at maximum compression, this is where you have maximum acceleration. Or at maximum elongation, that's also where you would have maximum acceleration as well. Cool. But if you look at these two points, so here, as this thing oscillates back and forth, back and forth, if you will. So as this thing is moving out to elongate, once it's fully extended, what's it going to do? Change direction and go back. So it's going this way and has a positive velocity, but it changes direction going back having a negative velocity. What's its velocity right there when it's changing direction? Zero. And so we that the acceleration is at a maximum, but the velocity is at a minimum, zero. Cool. So you guys might also recall that we looked at the potential energy, elastic potential energy stored by a spring, and it's 1 half kx squared. So it depends on the displacement squared for potential energy. So where would we have the most potential energy? Equilibrium. What's x at equilibrium? Zero. Is that a lot of potential energy? No. So not there. Where would we have the max potential energy? Well, when we have the maximum displacement, which would be here and here as well. Again, that's when it's got the most elastic potential energy. When would it not have any potential energy then, Albert? Equilibrium. At equilibrium position. There's no potential energy here. What's the only kind of energy it actually has here? Kinetic. But does it have kinetic energy here or here? No. no. So all the mechanical energy, the total potential plus kinetic, it's all potential here all kinetic at the equilibrium position. Cool. So at the equilibrium position, it's all what kind of energy? Kinetic, which means if it's all kinetic, this is when it's going to have the highest what? Velocity. So this is at the equilibrium position when we would achieve Vmax. Sine function also oscillates between 1 and negative 1 as well. So, correct. At the extremes, that's when your velocity function goes to 0. So, and if you look, the only difference between sine and cosine is they're just shifted from each other a little bit. And so notice, when you start at 0, your sine function's at 0, but your cosine function's at 1 at its maximum, where the sine is at 0. So, and so they're just out of phase a little bit, explaining the difference between these guys here. In this case, what would be the formula for that acceleration at either one of these points? What would be the formula? 
a omega squared. Cool. What would be the formula for the velocity at the equilibrium position? A omega. Sweet. So provided you remember this, these are the most common points where they're going to ask you questions about these lovely quantities. If I said, what's the velocity when it's fully compressed, you're going to say zero. If I'm going to say, what's the acceleration, you're going to say A omega squared, so on and so forth. Cool. So omega is your angular velocity. So, and rather than looking at, in this case, you know, your meters per second, it's technically in radians per second. So when it talks about the oscillatory motion, how fast that's being completed sort of thing. And so not quite the same thing as velocity, as your you know, translational velocity that we normally think of, but it's more of an angular velocity. So we dealt with the same kind of thing in circular motion, so, and it dealt with the angle per second instead of the meters per second. So cool. Cool. Works the same way with your pendulum. So when does your pendulum not have a velocity. Uh, the, extremes. the extremes. Same points. That's why I put them like kind of with each other here. When does it have a max velocity? Equilibrium. Equilibrium position. So on and so forth. When is the acceleration at a maximum? The at the extremes. And it works exactly the same way. <laughs>